um, because thanks to Bob for flagging this earlier on today, our next choice cut is going to be in April, um, April 18th, I believe. I think that's right, isn't it, Bob? Yeah, it is. Yep. Brilliant. So hoping to see you all there. I have to admit the topic is to be determined because I think it's me writing it and I haven't decided yet. But uh, <laughs> And while we're still waiting for Claire, if anybody has any like burning ideas of things they like would urgently like to see covered, you know, please feel free to send them in because often it's me, Bob and Claire sort of sitting and, and wow. thinking and trying to come up with something amazing. And we do have something amazing this month, which is brilliant. Um, but yeah. Sometimes we do scratch our heads a little bit. So if you, any of you have any ideas, that'd be wonderful. Claire, you're back. Yeah, if you believe oh, it. Oh, there powerful. you are. Hooray. So I'm going to unblur my background. You've got me um, in the Dimpsey. Um, <laughs> so that, that's gone to plan. Who knows what happened? So we're now slightly at the mercy of how long um, my, my mobile data and my phone battery last and my laptop. So this could prove to be an exciting session. We might have to tag team Jude and Jeff. Um, <laughs> sorry, Abel, um, <laughs> you couldn't write this stuff. So, um, so yes, uh, if um, Jude's covered most of the house, welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, and uh, it, it's as a student, it's a really um, it's a really good opportunity to just ask any and all questions in relation to halal. Um, uh, there is there is no question too small, too simple or otherwise. So without further ado, um, I'm going to spotlight Al. And, um, he's also got a couple of slides to explain um, sort of some of the, uh, the perhaps the, the facts and figures, the best way to put it. Um, and as always, questions in the chat, um, and particularly until Owl's uh, finished his, his little presentation, and um, other than that, in the chat, or raise your hand, usual form, please. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Claire, for your kind introduction. Uh, so, uh, I think it's, it's an opportunity for us to just share ideas or discuss the issues we have around halal. So, I will be covering the economic and the ethical issues for, I'll be opening up for, for us to discuss as we go along. So my name is Awal, as Claire said, and I work for AHDB. I'm sure we all know uh, AHDB. I work in the export team and we are headed by Dr. Phil Hadley with colleagues covering markets across the world. We've got people in Asia, uh, we've got Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, Europe, and almost everywhere. And we cover all species, including dairy. So I'm not gonna talk too much about the team. But in terms of the halal market, there are key destinations that our products or UK products uh, go to. So we are lucky or we are blessed to have a domestic market that keeps growing, that has got potential to grow, that has got value, which we our, our processes continue to access. We also have the EU market, which is just at uh, around the corner, which is at our doorstep, uh, which we continue to access despite Brexit. Uh, we've got the Middle East market, which is also a growing market, which is entirely halal. But we also know that the Middle Eastern countries are unable due to climate, are unable to uh, to produce meat that meet their 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 uh, their demand. So they produce around 10% and 90% of the products are imported. We've got the Americas, particularly in Canada, where we do ship some products too. There is Asia, we've got China. China, uh, you may not uh, see it as a halal destination, but it's, it's a, a huge halal market. Then we've got the count countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. There are other markets which are put there as other because these markets are markets that may not be high value markets, but that are very, very significant in terms of balancing carcass. So for instance, the Sub-Saharan African market, most of our, our feed quarters, so the heads, the, the feet, the, the offal will end up in countries like Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire are huge markets for our fifth quarter. So now let's quickly look at the domestic market. The aim is to just try and summarize this so that we can discuss it. Uh, we will have uh, sufficient time to discuss it. 
So in terms of the domestic market, it is valued at 3.2 billion. And this is in a study I actually co-authored with colleagues from uh, Huddersfield University. And we, 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 we estimated the value to be around 3.2 billion pounds. It's not published yet. It's going to be published very soon. When it's published, I'll share it with Claire so that Claire can then uh, share, with, uh, share it with everyone. What accounts for the, the, to, for the value is mainly around population growth. So the halal, uh, although the, the Muslim population forms around 6.5% of the general population, we know from studies that the, the Muslim consumer consumes above average uh, volume of meat or amount of meat when we compare the Muslim consumer to the, to the general population. We also know that the Muslim uh, consume or the Muslim community have got a high fertility rate. So if you compare, if there are Muslims in this, in this webinar, I'm sure there are, if you ask the Muslims versus the non-Muslims, how many kids they have, it's very likely that the Muslims will average around two and the non-Muslims will average around one. So uh, yours truly has got four kids. So that is just an example. And if, if we're to, to sort of put it in perspective, that is what we're gonna find. We know that from uh, other countries have got, uh, other countries such as those in the Middle East have got higher disposable income. So combining the fact that they consume a lot of meat, they've got a huge population, and also they've got higher disposable income, it can only mean one thing for businesses, which is good news. When we also talk about the high fertility rate, uh, if you look at the population of England or England and Wales from 2000, between 2011 to 2020, 21, the population of the whole of, of England and Wales grew by 3.5 million. Compare that to the Muslim population, the Muslim population expanded by 1.16 million. That is 33% increase in population. That is a huge amount of increase. And it also just tells you that uh, Muslims are nocturnal. We get busy at night, so we continue to, to have more children. Then uh, we know that peak, peak consumption is around the religious festivals. Uh, uh, we, we've got a number of festivals. One of them is going to be next month uh, in March, which is Ramadan. Although during Ramadan, we, we do not eat from morning or t t from dawn till uh, sunset. We, uh, when we break our fast or during our breakfast or during the, the morning meals, we consume a lot of meat. So you will realize that meat consumption will go up during the Ramadan season. There is also another one called Kurbani or Eid al Adha. That is an important festival during which every capable Muslim is encouraged to pay for an animal to be slaughtered on their behalf. We estimated that last year, no, last year, yes, uh, around 80,000 small ruminants were slaughtered during the Kurbani festival but there is room for up to 300,000 animals. There are complexities. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Maybe uh, during another meeting, we'll discuss it. I also said Muslims consume above average. AGB did a study not long ago. That was in 2020. And we found that uh, Muslims consume, 60% uh, of Muslims indicated that they consume lamb at least once a week, whilst the general population, only 6% of the general population consume lamb at least one per, uh, once a week. That is a huge, uh, a massive uh, gap there. And if you look at the, 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 the trend, uh, consumption of lamb within the general population is on the, on the, on the downward trajectory whilst that, that in the Muslim co uh, community is on an upward trajectory. We also know that mutton, almost 90% of mutton goes into the halal market. And you can test this by going to any of the supermarkets. You hardly find mutton in Tesco, Asda, Morrison's, or any of the big guys. But if you go to any independent halal supermarket, you will find, uh, you will find mutton there. Or go to some of the, uh, there, are, there are halal counters in some of the mainstream supermarkets, you will find mutton there, but you will never find it on a Tesco labeled or a, a, a Tesco owned label or any of the uh, retailers owned label. You'll never find mutton there. This is, uh, the last point is very important for those who are interested in welfare. Halal meat beef production remains very low in the UK due to slaughter methods. 
And the reason for this is that, well, also the, the, uh, one thing to note there is that the majority of halal beef that is consumed in the UK is imported. It's imported from either Ireland or other, other countries. And the reason for this is most of our beef, I believe over 90%, is done with what we call the penetrative captive bolt. That method is not accepted by the majority of Muslims. So not until we find a halal consistent or compatible method, the production of halal beef will remain very low. We know that New Zealand has got a system called the Jarvis Beef Standard without the cardiac arrest cycle, which is accepted by the, uh, many Muslims, but we do, it is that there are other legal uh, restrictions around the use of that Jarvis Beef Standard here. HSA, the Humane Slaughter Association, funded my PhD to look at developing a new system for halal beef. We managed to produce a prototype, but that prototype, there's still a lot of work to be done to the prototype to make it a commercial product. So I want you to focus on this picture on your screen. If you, if you, if you look at it critical, I'm just gonna uh, minimize the, the video, yeah. So if you look at it critical, you see products there that you would normally not find in any of the supermarkets. But these products are, are, are found in halal retails. So you, you get cow feed there, you get the feet of small ruminant, you even get the head of small ruminant in there. You get a tribe. I, I doubt if anybody on this uh, webinar who is not a Muslim has eaten tribe in the next in the in the last twelve months. It's just not happening. Liver you may find in conventional supermarkets. So what this picture is telling us is that the halal market presents an opportunity for carcass balance. Without the halal market, some of these products would have ended up in the bin. So that is just telling us that there, there is a market there for some of these products, for processes who want to maximize prof profit or who want to carcass or to balance their carcass, they can access the market. Also, the, 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 the uh, cash use, the majority of cash use will end up in the halal market because there's just no market for it in the, in the conventional uh, arena. Another thing is, uh, I've, got, I've noted the last point that mutton is preferred by ethnic curry houses because the way they cook mutton in, uh, in curry houses is they put so much spices. So you, you, you hardly feel the flavor of the meat anyway. And it's more suited to that sort of uh, way of cooking. So that is one of the reasons why you get a lot of mutton being consumed within the Muslim community. I remember a story, I, I was in Manchester, I think I, may, some of you may have heard this story before. I was in Manchester uh, to, to, to attend an event and one of the one guys, of the guys invited, invited me to, 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 to dinner. So he said, oh, let's, let's go for, for, for dinner. So I, uh, I tagged the way along and when we arrived, he said, this was a guy from Pakistan. He said, oh, I want hot. I, he wanted the, the product to be hot. So he, he asked me, oh, do you want it mild or hot? I also wanted to look a little bit tough. So I said, oh, I'll also go for, 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 uh, for the strong one. So I took the strong one and I can promise you that when I went back to my hotel, I couldn't really sleep well. And the next day I, I wasn't able to walk properly. Uh, uh, it's fair to say my backside was on fire. Because, uh, so if you're not familiar with these things, when you go with, with your Asian friends and they ask you which one, just go for the mild. That's just a caution for you. So let's move on to, this is important for those who are interested in welfare. Halal compatibility methods can be very tricky to understand. So let's take small ruminants first. The default method or the method that is accepted by all is the slaughter without stunning. I know there are welfare issues surrounding it, but that is the method that is accepted by all. And the reason for this is during halal meat production, there is a requirement for the animal to be, to be alive at the point of slaughter. We know during slaughter without standing, there is 100% guarantee that the animal is, is alive. So that is one of the reasons why many people prefer this method. The other one is that head-only electrical standing, which, uh, which is a method of standing where you apply electric voltage to the head in order to disrupt brain function, 
is generally accepted by all those who accept stunning, all the Muslims who accept stunning. It's important to also note that there are Muslims who will not accept stunning full stop. But there are uh, those who accept stunning, all of them will accept head only electrical stunning. And the reason for this is we know during head only electrical stunning, you only affect the brain, you don't affect the heart, and you don't actually cause any physical destruction to uh, physical destruction of the brain. All you do is you uh, you uh, you disrupt neural communication by disrupting uh, disrupting uh, uh, new uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. So you don't really cause any physical injury or you don't really stop the heart. So that is generally accepted. Let's go to mechanical penetrative and non-penetrative. In terms of small ruminant, it is not uh, the preferred method or head to body standing where you stop the heart that is also not acceptable. So you hardly find any reputable halal statifier accepting penetrative captive bolt or head to body stun. Because these uh, products, uh, this, this method of standing do not guarantee that the animal is alive. So the, the preferred ones are slaughter without standing and head only electrical standing. Let's go to uh, poultry. Poultry, the, the commonest one for halal meat production is water bath standing. And that is accepted by all those who accept stunning, all the Muslim authorities who accept stunning. However, there is a caveat here in terms of the, what, what I've written in notes, uh, in, in red. The Better Chicken Commitment has called for water bath stunning to be abolished by the year 2026. Now we need to be very cautious here. If you get rid of water bath stunning without an alternative for halal, it's very likely that people will move to uh, slaughter without stunning. So it's a balance there. We know our water bath stunning has got a lot of welfare issues from invasion and life shackling, pristan shocks, receiving some birds, receiving insufficient uh, current. But it's, there's a saying that half a loaf is better than nine, none. So we need to ask ourselves, do we abolish uh, what about standing in 2026 without an alternative or do we wait for an alternative for poultry, for halal poultry before we get rid of uh, what about standing? There is studies going on in Royal Veterinary College led by uh, Troy Gibson and Jeff Lines looking at an alternative for what about standing that does not involve inversion of the chicken, but is something that is working good of progress. There's also controlled atmosphere stunning, which is not accepted because in the UK, the simple rule is that the, the birds must die in the chamber before they exit. So that is just not acceptable. You hardly find any reputable certifier or halal authority accepting that. There is also mechanical stunning, which is used in, in, uh, in small throughput abattoirs. That is also not accepted by the Muslim community. I'm just gonna go quickly here. I told you, I said uh, that uh, Muslims require the animal to be alive at the point of slaughter. Now, the UK introduced the demonstration of life, which was supposed to be used as an assurance to, to assure the Muslim communities that, uh, that the Muslim community that had only electrical standing of small ruminants does not cause their death. Because that is when, uh, if you are able to assure them that, uh, that it doesn't kill, there may be some acceptance, some, some uh, consumers accepting that method. So it is an assurance tool that was introduced uh, to show that uh, stunning electrical head only stunning of, of small ruminants is non lethal, uh, likely to, put, uh, to improve consumer perception of UK sheep meat, uh, may impact positively on the amount of products we export to the Muslim majority countries. I think this is my la last slide. So for those of you who export, those people within this webinar who, who export to countries, uh, uh, particularly in the Middle East, you realize that there are some challenges. So one is shelf life. If you compare our products to, to the Australians, the Australians are able to give between 90, uh, 70 and 90 days of shelf life. Whilst our processes, um, and I'm talking about uh, uh, sheep meat uh, at this point, our processes can only give maybe up to 40 days. And this is because historically we, we had Europe just at uh, our doorstep. So we didn't really need huge 
uh, shelf life. So there is some sort of there, there is a need for us to not, to now look at ways we can extend shelf life of our product, and that would uh, require a lot of uh, research, a lot, a lot of involvement of, of of different bodies to ensure that we get things right. Seasonality is something that we cannot control because our our products are seasonal, and when they are off season, prices will go up. So it's something that we we are we are we are. It's a challenge that we are facing, particularly in the Middle East, where um, the majority of our products land. So that is it. I'm gonna stop sharing so that maybe we could just discuss it. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think I think we're okay. I the people amongst you might notice that actually um, I've got some light back, so that's good news as well. So we've had uh, a few questions in the chat, which I'm just going to um, hopefully work through from the beginning. If I haven't just minimised the screen completely, there we go. That's better. Um, so uh, we've got a couple from Julian. Um, so. This is a really basic one, uh, perhaps to start with, or it might seem basic to you, but, um, not otherwise. Um, and Julian wanted to know what the reason um, is for why Muslims don't eat pork. Uh, it's sort of probably maybe one of the fundamental things that people will know about halal is why do Muslims not eat pork? And Julian asks, is it because pigs are omnivorous and Muslims cannot eat pork? That is a very good question. Uh, there are several reasons for that, but... I'm not gonna dwell too much into the reasons, but as if, if there's anyone, any practicing Christian or practicing Jew or practicing Muslim amongst them, some of these religious rules, you take them as face value. You do not question, religion is something, you cannot question the rules. But a number of people have given uh, reasons for that, but I'm not gonna speculate. So, uh, I would it, expect it's, written, it's written down, isn't it? Oh, it's correct. It's written in, in the text that that's the it case, is, or have I got that? Is, if you look at what I, I'll, I'll just cite one of the, 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 the verses of the Quran. If you look at Quran chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Prohibited for you are dead animals, and it counts a number of things, including pork. It doesn't give the reasons why. So and as a practicing person, normally you don't you don't ask why. But uh, I know there are Muslims in this conversation. Let me just see if I can pick one of them to answer to see if he's got a reason. But I I really really do not want to speculate. Let me see if I can find Nazir. Do you want to come in to to explain why it's it's, it's not acceptable? If not, I think we should crack one. And make <laughs> if you want to put anything in the chat, that's also fine. If if, yeah. if you don't want to comment, but it's a, it's a question, and uh, it for for non faith consumers, sometimes those sort of queries around um, uh, dietary laws, they they don't have an obvious answer. So thank you and appreciate your openness in in being able to discuss it as far as you can. Um, mm -hmm. And as I say, the chat's always open if anybody wants to pop something in. Um, and moving down in, in order, uh, we've got a couple of um, questions here. We've come from David. Um, and by the way, if I'm not asking you to, um, to un unmute and uncamera, um, please feel free if you want to, to speak in person, but you don't want to put people on the spot. And I do recognise that sort of we, we're coming to these questions a few minutes later. So um, for now, David, I'm going to ask a question for you. But when we come to C Cell, who I, I don't know who that is, so you're going to have to un unmute on camera in a moment. Um, then uh, please ask that person. So, firstly, David says, "Is mutton preferred for price for price reasons, or there are other, or is it primarily the reasons we've discussed um, that uh, sort of separated or differentiated in terms of uh, preference?" Price could be a factor, but we know sometimes uh, country of origin to place. A, a major role and it all boils down or it's, it, it's just due to the way the, the products is cooked. So we know people from Bangladesh prefer uh, prefer mutton, but if you go to North Africa and the Middle East, it's more lamb than mutton. And it's just the way, I believe it's the way the, the cooking style is more suited. They spend more time in the kitchen, so they, they spend hours cooking. And I gave the other example, 
with their curry where there's actually no need uh there's there's actually no impact of the flavor and the texture of the meat on the final pro, uh, on the final dish okay yeah. thank you david have you got any follow up you can shake your head because i can see you on screen at the moment no great Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so C cell, mysterious. Um, would you be able to on camera? <laughs> so apologies. Yeah. So it's an, it's another Claire. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. Then, though. <laughs> so so my question was around. You talked about um, Muslims eating a lot of UK meat, uh, lamb. Sorry, my apologies, lamb. Um, but prefer, but some Muslims preferring um, the beef to be imported because of the stun method why is it that lamb is acceptable from the UK and that the beef is not, or not yeah. to some Muslims? Just, just to clarify, they are not preferring beef to be imported, but the, the method of slaughter we use for beef in the UK is inconsistent with their beliefs. And the reason why small ruminants or lamb is, is is readily available or readily accepted is the fact that we use head only electrical standing of lamb which is generally accepted by the muslim community or by proponents of standing of of, of halal standing so that is why it's more acceptable but because for beef we use what is called a penetrative captive bolt that penetrates into the skull and you destroys the brain that. sorry Okay, so yeah, so that, that is just due to the slaughter method. Did can I just ask, could you explain that a bit further, please? Oh, well, so um, it, in in summary, the difference is around the 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 stunning men are available in the UK for cattle, which are generally not acceptable for mm. um, for 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 Muslims for halal. Uh, because they can't guarantee that the animals are alive at the point of slaughter versus the one that is in in predominant use in the UK for sheep, which happens to be um, a demonstrate that the animal is alive at the point of slaughter and generally is reversible, um, therefore is ex acceptable. Yeah. Is uh, that the best way to describe it? And does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Can okay. I ask a question, Claire, please? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I... Can you just introduce Dave, yourself? Because I'm afraid I can't see who's on screen. It's it's Dave Clapham from. Uh, from okay, York. Dave. Thank you. Uh, it, it's in relation to a couple of questions. In actual fact, uh, first of all, in relation to cattle stunning, uh, when you you've talked about the penetrative bolt, but there is also a concussion stunner that's available and that is used by some plants. Now I know there is obviously destruction of the cranial area, but it doesn't penetrate. So that's one question. Yeah. My second question is, it's, it's, uh, it's 10 years ago, I think it would be 10 or 11 years ago, I was in New Zealand and I was fortunate to go around a plant where they were using electrical stunning on cattle, yeah. uh, very similar to, to sheep or to pigs or whatever, but it seemed to be very effective. And to all intents and purposes, it fulfilled the requirements that Muslims require in that the, the heart is beating when effectively it's dispatched. And that was always the principle that I was under, on the understanding of. So two questions really, concussion stunner, and we already there already is an electrical method of stunning cattle available. Yeah, yeah those are very, very good questions, David. Uh, so the, the, the first, let's look at the penetrative uh, captive or the, the, the concussion, uh, the percussive stunning, stunner you mentioned. It is illegal in the UK on ruminants that are over 10 kilograms. So that is the first obstruction. You cannot use it on ruminants or you are not supposed to use it on ruminants over 10 kilograms. So we know cattle, even if it's a veil, it's likely to be, to be more than 10 kilograms. So that's the first of, uh, thing. But that method, as you said, is actually accepted by some reputable certifiers and also by countries in the GCC, in the Gulf countries. But we are, we are constrained by the fact that it is illegal. You cannot widely use it on ruminants that are over 10 kilos. The other bit is the, the, the electrical standard system in New Zealand. Claire and I, Claire White and I have been discussing this. It is accepted by majority of the countries in the, in the, in the Muslim world. However, again, 
It is illegal to be used in the UK because it uses post-tan electro immobilization. And post-tan electro immobilization has been established to be contrary to EC 1099, which is the EU legislation, and WATOC 2015 as well. Claire, do you want to add something? Um, well, yeah, that, that's the technical points around it. It, it New Zealand because it fits within the New Zealand welfare and slaughter framework, despite the fact that they're actually broadly similar. There's some very fine detail, which means that it can't be directly transferred over here. Um, and hence why I was looking at alternative methods that would fit within that existing framework. Bringing this bit around stunning to perhaps um, a bit of a, a sort of a general conclusion um, or at least sort of a bit of a capitulation. Um, it, would you say well, that at the moment there might be some missed opportunities for the UK market because um, we haven't quite got the, the stunning methods right for some of the major species like uh, beef and, and poultry and mm. that um, there, there's perhaps some opportunities there both for domestic and for, for export markets? Absolutely. Huge, huge opportunities are missed here. And I, I, I reiterated at the start that we currently import the majority of our beef from Ireland and other, other, other places. We do have some non-stand slaughter of beef, but as you, you got asked, everybody will, will know uh, it's very complex in terms of welfare when you slaughter uh, cattle without stunning. And I, I, I know people in the Middle East are waiting to, to, to buy British beef. There is a butcher, or there, there's a, a chain of uh, independent uh, retailers in, in Dubai called British Butcher. They are willing to buy beef tomorrow if we had a, cons a compatible, a halal compatible buffer of stunning. The trouble is uh, with, with penetrative captive bull, you may get somebody accepting it domestically, but it's illegal to, to, to export it to the Middle East because their standards are very, very clear. You cannot use penetrative captive bull. You may get somebody, there, there will always be people who are willing to, to break the rules, saying they will certify, but that is not acceptable. So if we were to find an alternative, I, I think uh, we'll get an uptick in uh, halal beef production. Brilliant. That's that's really good to know. Um, thank you for that. Apologies. Um, I'm not seeing your hands up. So if you think I've been ignoring you, well, I have, but it's not deliberate. So I'm going to come to uh, Tony first and then Joanna to, to pick up some of those hands that I've missed. And then we'll come back to the questions in the chat as well, please. So, Tony, please, um, camera and run mute, please. Thanks, Claire. And uh, evening all. And uh, especially to Al. Uh, Al and I have already had conversations about the opportunity for halal veal, and I have put a little bit in the uh, in in the chat about it because basically, because of our restrictions on uh, killing uh, over ten kilos on the on, on the calves, we are missing a, a market opportunity. And what's worse, we're actually importing halal veal into the UK. You can buy. Uh, Australian halal veal on Smithfield. You can buy Dutch halal veal on Smithfield, I, I understand as well. Uh, so we're missing an export opportunity to the Middle East and, and we're also buying in imported halal veal. And, and I had, I reached for my Quran. There you go. Not many people would say <laughs> that. And I did find one of the five surahs which uh, mentions uh, forbidden to you is the flesh of swine. Yeah. Uh, there are four other ones. Uh, just to try and answer Julian's question. But it, it, it is quite clear in there, forbidden to you. Uh, for food are dead animals, cattle, beasts not slaughtered, blood, the flesh of swine, uh, and that on which Allah's name has not been mentioned while slaughtering. See you on Friday at the mosque, Tony. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get in. They're all over the pavement, my local one. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic, Tony. Thanks for, for adding those points. Um, OK, so, uh, Joanna, I, I'm just going to do the same, please, if you can um, camera and unmute, please. Um, it's really great uh, to have this really different discussion. Thank you. And then we'll come back to the, the questions in the chat because they're, uh, they're stacking up, which is always a good sign. Hi, do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'll keep the camera off because my internet is a little bit hazy. I have a very basic question because I used to be somewhat um, puzzled by how is um, halal meat produced in 
um, in the UK at all, while to the best of my pretty basic knowledge, um, slaughter, as in killing without stunning, is illegal in the UK and in the European Union. So I, I used to wonder, like, how does it happen at all? And I would appreciate some input on that. But in addition to other things that you said, I... To be honest with you, I have I, I take a bit of issue with your with your argument because what I hear you say is advocating methods that while I am not an expert, you know, RSPCA and um, and you know all sorts of experts that I have been you know learning from um, in animal welfare and ethics of how they are treated. There's a special word for it that I now don't remember. They all agree that this is. Are like to the very least, you know, wrong or like low on welfare or unethical or whatever word you use. And also the the thing that you mentioned about, you know, about extending the the shelf life, it's again a compromise on quality. And the argument you make, there is money to make there. And while I do understand the economics of it, it still is something that doesn't really go down well to be honest okay thank you very much for your question which organization did you say you work for please excuse me which organization do you work for oh i work as a butcher i am okay, okay, in, okay. Involved yeah. in, i'm involved in several um educational programs uh, within okay. different forms of farming and that's where you know i get the input and RSPCA has, you know, standards, like for example, what you mentioned with the water bath with poultry is something that I think needs to go as soon as possible because, you know, seeing it up close and understanding how it works, it's it's nothing ever, I, I, I personally don't find it acceptable. And and again, and, and I, I wouldn't, I don't really, I do understand the economic argument. I just don't really think it is aligned with I would say generally European values as of reasons to, you know. Yeah, I completely get you. I completely get you. But just to let you know that I've actually written a paper, a peer reviewed paper, highlighting the welfare aspects of water bath stunning. I'm not a proponent of water bath stunning, but if you listen to what I said very, very well, what I was saying is that, look, water bath stunning is the only acceptable method of stunning for halal poultry. At present, if we get rid of it in 2026, it's likely to lead to an uptick in uh, the, the, the uh, people have, people will move away from water bath standing to non stand school. That is just a caution. But I'm, I do not, I'm not a proponent of any of the method I work for an evidence based organization. So I, I, I do not take a uh, side. I can highlight the facts, but I do not tell you to go and do non stand. No. You Excuse also have a question. Keep interrupting you just right now. Would you mind explaining me like the, the first thing? Because the basics is the one to understand. I don't understand. Like what makes meat halal in yeah. the produce in the UK when it doesn't shouldn't be stunned, as in what you explained. I understand that part. While yeah. to the best of my knowledge, that again it's limited, you yeah. cannot slaughter without with a, Okay, yeah, I get your question. I know your thing is breaking. I think you've got uh, a very, very bad, uh, well, your, your, the information you hold about UK animal welfare and EU animal welfare uh, regulation is inaccurate. So let me just spell it out to you. So mm -hmm. EC 1099 is the EU legislation on the protection of animal, uh, welfare of animals at the time of slaughter. And it's telling you, well, it, it says, in the well, if you look at Article 44 of the of, of that regulation, it says, in the case of uh, slaughter without uh, sorry, in the case of religious slaughter, member states have a de can apply a derogation that allows slaughter without stand. It's not me saying it is the uh, legislation, and it's, if you come to the domestic one, which is welfare of animals at the time of killing, which is what of 20, uh, 2015. It makes provision for animals to be slaughtered without stunning. If it's for uh, people of the Jewish faith or people of the Muslim faith. Uh, but what I'm saying is I'm not advocating for any method. What I'm saying is that I'm, I'm giving you facts 
of what is going on. Okay. I, I believe I've answered your question. <laughs> we might have lost your honor. If not, um, yeah. uh, Awal, I think, is more than happy to pick up some of these um, questions offline as well. Share, share some of my papers. I've, I've widely published yeah. on the matter. I've, I've highlighted the, 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 the welfare aspects of water bath study. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually just about to publish another paper on cattle, so I'll I'll be happy to share it with uh, you. That's fantastic. So, so Owl um, has got definitely more knowledge than we can have in an hour or, or several months, I think. So, um, I'm really sort of mindful of the time and sort of how much more time we could spend on just even the subject of stunning. But there's some market stuff, I think um, we want more as well in the uh, in the chat. So, but I know that Charlie's had his hand up for a while and um, thinking that uh, Charlie as the Humane Slaughter Association might have something to say on the matter of stunning. Charlie, could you just give us a couple of minutes of your time, please? And then we'll move on to some of the market questions as well, if that's okay. Yeah, okay, Claire. I was going back to when you were talking about import and that, and um, I, mean, I think I always said that you import beef and veal from Australia and Holland and elsewhere, but and Ireland, but you don't import non stun beef. So how do they stun the beef from those countries that we import if we can't yeah. if we can't use the non penetrative captive bolt here on animals above ten kilo? Yeah, thanks, so, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. So the the one in New Zealand, the one imported from New Zealand is with the Jarvis beef stunner. The correct. one yeah. yeah from Ireland, I am aware is some non-stun and non-penetrative captive bolt. So although we know the non-penetrative is, is illegal on, on ruminants over 10 kilograms across the EU, but I am aware in, in, in Ireland it's being used. It is Tony who mentioned the other countries. I'm not aware of products or I'm, I'm not uh, sort of familiar with the method of stunning or slaughter from the other methods that Tony uh, other countries that Tony mentioned, but I'm aware of the New Zealand, which is the Jarvis, and uh, Ireland, which is non uh, non stun slaughter and non penetrative cutting. So, uh, am I right in thinking that in 1099 there is a, an exemption from that limit of 10 kilos? Or... I don't think. It is it's black and white that there's an exemption for halal slaughter on ruminants over 10 kilograms with a non penetrative. But I think uh, there have been people, uh, abattoirs, got themselves into legal legal uh, litigations with, 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 with the competent authority. So I do not think it's clear black and white that they can use it. But as I said, I'm, I'm aware of its use in, in either. Yeah, that's what I heard. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming most of it, if all of it, would be from the Jarvis Electrical Stunner. No, no, there, there's something non-penetrative coming. Okay. So it's um, a really, it's a really important area, Charlie. Thank you um, for drawing that out. Uh, yeah. And um, as a bit of a plug, actually, I think it's an area that Owl and I are going to be working on um, to sort of establish sort of yeah. the, the the landscape essentially for stunning for beef as well. Um, and I'm going to pick this up now as something to, to add to the question list before we, we, we uh, move on. Um, and so again, a question from Claire um, regarding an alternative to water bath stunning for poultry that would be acceptable. So we can perhaps come back to the, at that at the end. Um, there's also scrolling up in the chat, um, just one question from Bill Jeremy about kosher beef being acceptable to Muslims. Before we move on to the market stuff, Owl, can I just ask you to answer Bill's question regarding kosher? Well, that is uh, another important question. We, 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 we did a study in 2017 where we interviewed uh, Islamic scholars within the UK. And we wanted to establish whether, first of all, whether they accepted stunning and whether they recognised kosher meat as halal. The information we had from most of them was that if there is no halal alternative at any given time, you could accept kosher. However, if you speak to majority of Muslims in the UK, 
they wouldn't want to consume kosher as as halal when there is abundance of halal. Having said that, there are set, uh, halal certifiers in the UK who would readily certify kosher meat as halal. So they would uh, readily stamp it with halal stamp. But if consumers know that this is kosher, many people will avoid it. So um, that's perhaps something we're not going to be able to cover today, but um, the, the topic of halal certification and what fits into those standards, uh, I'm picking up um, from what you're saying, Owl, that there's differences in how that's certified, whether or not it's within the UK and within existing uh, or within certification body standards or outside of the UK and what's being certified as halal there. So that's, that's quite interesting because effectively everything being certified or, or labelled as halal doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. Is that, is that the case? Yes, yes, I'll say yeah. Okay, so so the question that sort of the perhaps the the, the footnote to that then is that um, there's lots to discuss around halal certification. Okay, yeah. um, so T, um, quite some time ago, and thank you for your patience, Katie, has asked a couple of questions around uh, consumer trends um, and opportunities for offering halal options in restaurant sectors. Katie, if you're available, do you mind um, un un uh, cameraing and unmuting, please, um, yep. to ask those questions. No problem. Thanks, Claire. Um, hi, Thank Owl. Um, are there trends towards vegetarianism within um, the Muslim community? And how do you see opportunities for offering halal options in the UK restaurant sector? Thanks. Well, uh, I think I've come across a study which was published in 2019 where it showed an increase or a rise in uh, in, in in the number of vegetarian uh, uh, Muslim vegetarians. However, uh, I've also come across scholars who said uh, vegetarianism is not a thing in Islam because what we what, what Muslims normally do is that we tend to do what the Prophet peace be upon him did uh, during his time, and we know he he consumed meat, although he consumed meat on a very, very small scale. He, the prophet did not consume it as we do today. So the, the, the level of vegetarianism is, go, growing, up, is growing for, for different reasons, uh, for ethical, for, for, for health and other, other reasons. However, in terms of restaurants, yeah, there is opportunity for restaurants, uh, for, for halal restaurants. I was speaking to somebody in Dubai uh, last year and he was telling me there are, there are lots of uh, Muslims who are coming in from, from, from the Middle East looking for high-end restaurants, but normally we do not have these high-end restaurants. So there is an opportunity there, but maybe some sort of studies may be needed to sort of pinpoint what exactly is needed. But there is, there is opportunity uh, for restaurants to, to sort of access or tap into the halal market. Thank you. That's fantastic, Carol. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask um, one of my questions that I had as well. And, it, and it's, it's sort of focusing on, on those market trends. Um, you've, you've got this unpublished work at the moment around the value of the, the halal sector to the UK. Um, do you have any insight into sort of what categories of products those are and whether or not it, it's, there's particular areas in, in which um, uh, businesses focus? Yeah, so in terms, if, you, if we look at the, the, the order, uh, the, uh, the, the, the preference in terms of uh, the, the species, poultry is the most popular, followed by, by lamb or sheep meat, and then beef is the least popular. And the, the reason for this is uh, for the beef being low, uh, ranked low is the slaughter method again. I know Muslims who will avoid uh, beef unless they are certain, they are 100% they are certain that the animal was not stunned with penetrative captive bullets. So that is affecting the consumption of beef. But the AEDB report and the one we, we, are, we are about to uh, publish highlight the fact that we, we categorize the, the, the score, we rank preference and poultry is on the top, sheep meat and then beef. That's fantastic. And, and do you any insight then into um, sort of value-added products, those kinds of things, um, whether or not there, well, there's any there's any growing interest there. 
the the one the AGB report did throw some light in it, but speaking to people like uh, the, the independent retailers like uh, Shazans, uh, Tarek Halal, and Haludis, they seem to be doing very well in that space, in value-added products. I, I do not have empirical uh, data to support their sales or their, their, uh, their activities, but there is some evidence in the ADB report that Muslims tend to cook at home. They, they, if you compare Muslims to the general population, Muslims cook at home more and they're looking for more uh, more modern products, so burgers, sausages, and modern cuts as well. So there, there is market for value addition, but we just need more uh, research to be done in that. Thank you. So another opportunity there. I think we can Absolutely. take away from this. There's lots of opportunities right through from primary yeah. production all the way through um, to exports and to, to value added and, and even us understanding the market better. I'll keep yeah. you busy for a while, probably. Um, I'm going to go back to Jude because you put a question in um, a little while ago regarding um, the the decisions to include or exclude um, halal on on in uh, in food service, so um, public procurement, so within in schools and hospitals. Um, so that might provide another fertile area of discussion. So Jude, can I uh, ask you to come in? Yeah, of course. So I live in a sort of semi-rural area of Oxfordshire and uh, one of our newer schools um, only started up a few years ago now, made the decision to go with all halal meat. Um, they banned packed lunches. You know, it 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 caused quite a lot of controversy, to be fair. And they've since um, revoked the decision. And, and I found it interesting because we live in a pretty non-culturally diverse area, frankly. You know, this is not an area that's known for having a massive population of anything other than sort of white, ca um, white Caucasians. So it seemed like a slightly odd choice, really, in quite a lot of ways. Um, so I just wondered whether that was something that you'd seen elsewhere across the UK. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's actually caused a lot of uh, trouble, well, a lot of debate arguments in Lancashire, Kettleys and other areas uh, up north where the, the other thing was a little bit different, uh, Jude. I think yours may be the, the, the added or the, the required procurement of halal products. So that could include stand halal. But the ones I'm, uh, the, the other examples I have, I'm giving you, they only required non-stun halal. So that was very controversial and that created a lot of uh, sort of arguments up north. But you, do you want to uh, throw some lights on it? Was it for halal or for non-stun halal? So it just said halal, to be honest. So I don't know. Um, and, you know, again, we live in a sort of rural, but not very agricultural area. So everybody I talked to didn't really even know what that meant. You know, they were like, well, I've sort of vaguely heard the term, but I can't remember which religion it's associated with, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it did seem like a strange, a strange choice, just given the population around here. So um, I just wondered whether it was happening, you know, all over the country and I'd missed it. Yeah, it is happening in some countries. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, in some counties. And the some are actually demanding or requiring the, the procurement of only non-stand. So it, it is quite, it, I think it probably is a um, uh, kind of a microcosm, isn't it, of the broader discussion we're having, having around um, uh, stand on stand um, and then uh, where that fits then into markets. So I, that was another fantastic question. Um, sort of an addendum to that, uh, Tony wonders whether there's been a market for halal pet food. Has that been anything that's ever cropped up on your radar? Yes, I've had uh, a number of conversations around that. Somebody contacted me recently in LinkedIn and uh, we're actually going to Dubai on Saturday for golf food. Uh, or during golf food, you, you get a lot of stalls just uh, advertising halal pet food. Uh, so it's, it's a thing, uh, particularly they want assurance from processes that the product is not containing pork. That's the first thing. And Possibly, if, if you want to use bows or other products, it should preferably come from halal slaughtered uh, uh, animals. But some will accept 
non-halal slaughtered animal as long as it's not pork. See, I'm wondering whether it, if, if there is a market for British halal pet food. In fact, I feel a dragon's den pitch coming on here. <laughs> if you can brand it well, they will. I think it, they, there will be uh, some sort of appetite for it because, you know, they flag, the British flag sells. So if you can brand it properly, uh, you will find people buying it. Fantastic. Another opportunity. So um, I think we've, uh, we've, we've identified some opportunities, hopefully, and some challenges. Um, I'll just come back, circle back around to Claire's question um, around uh, alternative methods of poultry um, uh, for, is an alternative to water bath stunning. You, you picked up on the presentation hour, but if you wouldn't mind just um, expanding on that a bit more, we'll take that as the last comment uh, before I start to wrap up, if that's okay. Sorry, my, my screen went off slightly. Can you repeat that, Claire, please? Okay. Um, uh, Claire asked um, whether or not there was an alternative method available instead of water bath stunning uh, for poultry, basically. And this is going to be, this is the last comment before I wrap up. So if you just wouldn't mind explaining um, the, the bit around um, availability of stunning methods of poultry again, that'd be super. Yes. Yeah, so apart from the water bath stunning, there is... Well, there is the, the one in RBC, which is still uh, a, a, which is still work in progress. So that's the Royal Veterinary Actually, College. They're, they're trying to develop a new method. Sorry for cutting across you. Yeah. Yeah. There is the Dutch Vision one, which I'm gonna invite Claire to explain because you 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 understand it better than I do. So if you wanna, do they have commercial units in Holland? I I don't, I don't think so. But do you wanna come and explain that, please? Yeah, so there are variations on the theme basically around electrical head, heads only stunning for, for chicken um, and none of them are currently available uh, op operationally in the UK. The one that Awa mentioned is still uh, very much prototype stage um, being developed by the Royal Veterinary College um, in consultation um, with uh, Muslim uh, scholars and authorities. Um, and then the, the other method is essentially an electrical head only stun um, as opposed to birds being immersed in electrified water um, and that uh, has been developed but it's not operational. It's, it, it was developed in, in the Netherlands but um, they, they ran into some difficulties I think with the news of the Netherlands um, authorities. So um, there are a couple of methods. The other thing to point out, uh, the, the one that is available on the shelf um, but not working here in the UK, the Dutch Vision system, is that it's not supported by the Better Chicken Committee which is was um, brought into being by Compassion and World Farming because the birds um, all supported are still inverted during the process so um, it, it's an option but it's not one that's going to meet the commitments of the BCC to, uh, to, to phase out water bath stunning. So there are technical challenges but Equally, there are quite significant opportunities and I think it's within all of us probably to, to work together to overcome some of those um, technical challenges if we can uh, to markets and, and look for opportunities. Uh, just as a, a final word from you, Awal, uh, we're looking to the future now for, for Halal. Um, if you look back maybe 10 years or 15 years, can you sort of describe the sort of the, the, the sort of where where the the, the sector has, has gone come from within the context of UK meat processing and where we're heading to hopefully. Yeah I think our understanding around halal is improving. When I started working with HDB that was in 2017 I went to a farm to visit uh, to to speak to some farmers and somebody uh, one of the farmers said look I don't want to speak to you about halal. I said why? He said because you you guys you are barbaric towards animals. So I, I wanted him to explain what he meant by that. Then he said, you slaughter all your animals without stunning. Then I, I had to dig out the FSA data to actually demonstrate to him that, look, the majority of animals are actually stunned before slaughter. So and it, is, it is not just this farmer who thinks that. Way. There are so many people who maybe a few years ago would have thought the same thing. But I, I believe the activities of AEDB has now reached out to more farmers, to more abattoir operators, and even to consumers to create awareness about what is going on around Hala. And I believe in the next few years, our, our strategy, our, our strategy document uh, spells out or identify export as, as an important uh, 
segment or, or an, as an important element for our uh, for our meat processes. And we are investing a lot of money within ADB to develop so many markets, to open markets, to maintain markets, and to collect market uh, intelligence for our, our processes. So I think the future is looking bright. Let's continue to work together and continue to pay your levies if there are levy payers with us so that we can develop the market for you. There we go. We get that pitch in right there at the end. So uh, thanks, Awal. It's been um, too short a session as it usually is with you. Um, I'm I'm not sure whether the master joined us um, in the end. I haven't checked the participant list recently. No. Um, no. Okay. Um, I, in which case, I'm going to defer to immediate past master um, Margaret, um, if that's possible, to just. Um, make some closing remarks and then we'll let everyone go for the evening. If that's okay, Margaret, sorry for putting you on the spot. That's all right, Claire. Done it before. I'm sure you'll do it again. Um, I have actually just put my comments um, in the chat. Um, I, I felt, Claire, far too sure. I've learned a lot, but I need to better understand. And, and I think when we talk about halal slaughter, nobody... The average person doesn't understand what goes on behind that. And where else are we ever going to have these discussions? You know, it's not something you chat about normally. So, you know, whilst um, you're always looking for really interesting subjects, I personally think give it a few months and you could come back to this one and update us because it, it's it's fascinating. Um, and I've got lots of questions which I will um, either ping across to you, Claire, or you, Owl. But really, so, thank you so much. I found it really, really interesting. And I think you've got something like 36 people on, on the call. So that's a really good number. It was a subject that obviously um, people are interested in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Margaret. And it is great. I think it's a record, actually, for the number of people in person. So, Owl, well, that's, okay. that's one for you for, the, for choice cuts. So it is a really complex subject, uh, Margaret, and, and I think opportunity to continue this conversation. Um, if you haven't got Owl's details from the um, the, the final slide, um, well, if you're happy to share them either in the chat or, or separately, then we're more than happy to, to continue this conversation. Um, thank you as well for the slides and for, for the one pager. And um, yes, if there's an interest, we will come back and update um, perhaps on, on particularly on stunning methods. But other than that, it's to say thank you very much for the time and effort you've put into this evening. My last comment is to plug um, the next Choice Cuts, which is on April the 18th. Um, I didn't forget, Bob. Um, I'm sure you thought I would. Uh, so we've got the next one. I don't think we've decided the subject yet. Um, and apologies if we have. So, uh, but it will be published uh, published in the next few weeks and uh, it will probably be another external speaker. So it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Owl. Um, any further comments or are we happy to let everyone go? No, I think we, 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 can, we can go. But somebody asked a very important question, whether in the Quran, uh, whether there's a requirement for God's name or Allah's name to be mentioned. Yes, there is a requirement for that to be mentioned before slaughter. And that is just... That is also very similar to what Christians do. You know, before Christians eat, they give the grace. They give, they say, thank God for the food provided. It's very similar to, to the grace that uh, Christians do. It's just to say, thank you, God. Well, you say, Bismillah, Allah, but in the name of God, God is great. To, to signify the fact that you're about to take the life of an animal, which is very important. Thanks, Awal. That's good. There's always more that, sh that uh, joins us and divides us. So um, generally a good way to look at life. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much once again. And uh, let's continue this conversation um, Yeah, uh, via email, preferably, until next time. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, all. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.